So, are you sitting comfortably? Okay, then I'll begin. <clears throat> Once, long ago, in a land not so far from here, there lived a rich and powerful king named Prodigious. And our story begins on Prodigious's 50th birthday, and he decided to have a very special event. He assembled all the people who were really important to him and decided to have a treasure giving ceremony. Okay, so he brought his two sons, his wife, and the beautiful and wise wife of his youngest son, who was named Sophia. And he gave them each a chest full of treasure, and he'd had his advisors take very, very great care to ensure that there was the precise same amount of treasure in each of the two chests. Well, Tempus and his wife Sophia were just delighted to be given a chest full of treasure. They weren't expecting such a beautiful gift. They had each other and now they'd got incredible wealth. Well, life was good. Unfortunately, Prince Graspian, the eldest son, was a little bit disappointed because he's the eldest and he expected to be given more treasure because of his senior status. So he was not well pleased. Nonetheless, Tempus and Sophia just continued enjoying life. They could do all the things they'd wanted around the castle, fix up the bits and pieces that had been unfinished for a long time, satellite TV, jacuzzi, all the usual things that you would do when you inherit such wealth. And one of their favorite things to do was in the summer evenings just to stand on the battlements surveying all their grounds and all the territory which they were now lord and lady of. And occasionally, when they were staring from the battlements, they would see Prince Graspian charging around on his mighty war horse. He'd become famous for this horse. In fact, he spent all the treasure on building the largest army that anybody had seen for many, many centuries in that part of the world. And he expended all the treasure that he'd been given. But in his mind, he knew, I know where there's a secret stash of treasure and I aim to get my hands on some of it. So, <clears throat> one sunny morning, Prince Graspian approaches Tempus's castle, says, brother, I've run out of treasure. Could you possibly, could you find it within yourself to loan me some of your treasure? And of course, they both knew that loan was the wrong word. <laughs> Tempus said, well, of course, I love you. You're my brother. We're related. It'd be a pleasure to give you some of my hard-earned treasure. And the good deed was done. But sadly, that set a bit of a pattern. And eventually, every week or so, Prince Graspian would be back saying, look, I need more treasure. Sorry about this, but I need more treasure from you. Until finally, Tempus had to say, Look, I'm sorry, I do love you, but I can't keep giving you all of this wealth because I need it for my own reasons. I've got my own family to look after. I've got my own projects that I need to do. So sorry, that's it on the treasure front. Well, Prince Graspian didn't take this well. Okay? He hadn't been on any kind of coaching or self-development course. <laughs> he didn't even know what an inner child was, but he just knew <laughs> that he was not, he was not pleased. So he decided to go the other route, and he said, if you won't give it to me willingly, I'm going to take it from you anyway. It's war. And he announced, got his army out, and said, folks, assemble. We're going to go and take some treasure. Well, Tempus heard the news, and he realized it's trouble time, and this is not what I wanted, but I've got no choice. I have to defend what's mine and what's important to me. So the armies gathered, the drawbridge was shut, shut up, the gates were closed, and war began. Scary battle, I'm sure you'll agree. So, <laughs> The only way that Tempus could push back Graspian and his hordes was that he'd ride out on his own wars and say, back, it's mine and you're not having it. But of course, nobody likes being at war all the time, do they? Nobody likes being shut up with all the defences up and the gates closed. Nobody likes to live like that. And Tempus and Sophia were the same. They wanted to go out and just enjoy the scenery, enjoy the countryside. And a sunny morning arrived and they decided, let's take a walk in the grounds. It's been a stressful time. It's been a difficult period in our lives. So let's just go and enjoy. And they were so keen to go and enjoy that actually they made a critical mistake. They forgot to put the drawbridge up. You've all been there, right? You know what it's like with the drawbridge. Sometimes you just can't be bothered to uh, put it up, can you? <laughs> Well, of course, Graspian seized the opportunity. He realized this is his moment. And while they're off enjoying the scenery and enjoying themselves generally, he's sneaking in. He knows what he wants. He knows where it is. Finally, he lays his hand on the treasure. <laughs> I've won. I'm the victor. 
they've lost and I'm getting what I want. So <clears throat> Tempus and Sophia come back from their walk and sadly the story does not end well for them. <laughs> now, here's the question for you. How much sympathy do Tempus and Sophia really deserve? I mean, they had their treasure stolen, that's a bad thing, right? But they left the gates open. So how much sympathy did they really deserve? Ask yourself that. If you're sitting there late at night watching this on the web, ask yourself too. How much sympathy do they deserve? Well, our worldwide, global, highly sophisticated survey came to the conclusion that actually they deserve a small amount of sympathy, but not really very much, because they left their castle undefended. They left the doors open and they had their treasure stolen. So let's uh, update the parable a little bit. <clears throat> Obviously, we need a name for the treasure. And again, we've conducted global surveys here. And the best answer, according to our survey, was it could be our time, right? Didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> what if the treasure was our time? Okay, And what if we were trying to defend our time and stop the wrong people taking it? Let's think about some of the gates. What could they be? Well, how about <clears throat> my email clients? That's a means by which people can sneak into my world and demand my time, isn't it? Do you ever find that? Doing emails late into the night because somebody else decided to send it to you and demand some kind of response from you? They're stealing your time. How about your door, your office door, or even the front door? Knock, knock, have you got a moment? Well, in my head it's no, but I'll, I feel obliged to say, yes, of course, come in. They're taking my time. How about your phone? Okay, what a marvellous instrument that is. But how easy it is these days for people to just ring up when they decide they want to ring, and I'm obliged to do something about it right now. Even if the thing I decide to do is say, I can't talk to you, still I've had to stop what I'm doing and speak to them instead. So let's think about <clears throat> those three words. In the light of not having my treasure stolen by the wrong people. Okay, intend, defend, and then spend. Let's think about intending. <clears throat> Why not attach your time to your future? Okay, think about things that are in the future that need my time right now. Shouldn't that be a priority? Shouldn't I be putting my time there? I should be planning for the future before it happens. That's the best way to do it. If it matters, you need to give it time. You know, lots of people can tell us what their goals and ambitions are. All I need to see is your diary and your bank account, and I'll tell you what your goals and your ambitions are. Because it's where you're spending those two things, that's the giveaway, isn't it? So if it's important to you, how much time are you putting into it? <clears throat> of course, unallocated time is the most easily lost as well, isn't it? It's the time that I haven't aligned with something. That's the stuff that gets stolen so easily. Defend. Is it a friend or a foe? Even in the story, of course, sometimes we're going to give our time to people who we care about and to causes that matter. We're not saying it's only for me. But when a demand for your time comes, the first question should be, is this from a friend or from a foe? If it's a friend, give it to them. If it's from a foe, you need to keep it for something else. <clears throat> Rule or be ruled. Either you take control of your time or other people will take control of you with respect to your time. Take control of your technology, your phone, your office door, your email client, or it will rule you. And you need that time for more important things as we've been hearing about. But of course, let's be nice. The golden rule of all civilizations, isn't it? Do unto others as you would have them do to you. So in doing this, we need to be firm, but not unkind. Spend your time as though <clears throat> it's money. Treat it like money. You wouldn't give money out just willy-nilly, expecting nothing in return, would you? Don't just spend it, invest it. Put your time into things that are gonna give you back what you need and what the people who depend on you need. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. You can't bank time. That's one of the troubles with it, isn't it? You can't store it up for when you're really busy. You get the same number of hours and minutes in the day, whatever's going on in your life. General Eisenhower was a very busy general in the Second World War. When training his team up so that they could help him and take some of the workload off him, he made a very profound statement. And he said, you know, of all the things that are urgent, very few of them are important. And of all the things that are important, very few of them are urgent. So let's not get conned by urgency. Let's spend our time on the basis of importance. So at the end, let me give my talk a title. And it's called, Take Your Time. Because if you don't, somebody else will. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>